here is New York. Commuters give the city its title restlessness. Natives give it solidity and continuity, but the settlers give it passion. E.B. Waite would have described me as a settler. In fact, I became a New Yorker to pursue my passion for design. My name is Daniela Ohad. I'm here at the Elizabeth Collective, historic mansion in Midtown New York, where art and design live together, curated by Maison Gerard. Welcome to Harvest Dialogues. that British designer and tastemaker Ashley Hicks published was a memoir of his father, the iconic decorator David Hicks. He has since published many books. Last year, it was a major study of the interiors of the Buckingham Palace. And now, with his new book, Rooms with a History, he provides an insight into his creative process, his interiors, and those which inspire him. Ashley, hi. What brings you to New York? Well, hello, Danielle. I'm in New York to sort of pack up an exhibition of my work um, that's just closed at R and Company. This is the first time I've had a sort of solo exhibition. I want to talk to you about this amazing book. I read it. I loved it. And I know that your first furniture collection that you did in 1997 was your interpretation of the ancient Greek Christmas chair. By the way, my own favorite chair of all time. Yeah. And it captured your interest and passion for history, which is also, I think, informs this book. What is history to you? Oh, history is everything, isn't it? I think it's absolutely everything. You know, I went to um, a, a sort of radical modernist architecture school in London when I was a kid um, and graduated as an architect, and, and you had to be an absolutely modernist and not have any interest whatsoever in history, which was anathema to me. All I wanted was history. And so while I was there delving in the library, I found a book of ancient furniture, and there was a measured drawing of a Klismos chair done by an archaeologist in the 1920s. Um, so, and, and so I, I took this drawing and I went to India and found some carpenters in India who were working with the same tools that ancient Greek carpenters used to use. And I had them make reproductions of, of this chair. I dedicated the book to my mother. And she's now 90 years old. And she, she, she had a, a little tear in her eye when she read this dedication, which was very sweet. And, but um, you know, I, I said it's dedicated to her because she inspired me with her love and knowledge of history. Reading your book confirmed my own philosophy that one cannot create interiors of meanings and layers without a deep knowledge in history. But yes, no, I, I, th I think an awareness of history and you know some contact with you know, old historical motifs, historical traditions, is, is you know, a, a very enriching thing for an interior or, or, or for anything, really, you know. You came from a privileged background, but also you grew up in a family where interiors, decor, design, taste were crucial. And you talk about, in this book, you talk about decorating your own room when you were 15. Um, what was it like? <laughs> um, well, you know, my father, of course, was, you know, at the top of his game in whenever this was, 1980 or so, um, you know, and, and, and so he, he said to his three children, you know, we're moving to this new house, really, because I've spent all our money on our old house, so we've got to move to a smaller house, um, and so your rooms, do you want to decorate them yourselves or you want me to do them? And so both of my sisters were very polite and said, oh, Daddy, of course we want you to. And I was like, you know, no, just you know, give me the room, I'll do it. And so I made the entire thing black, black carpet, black walls, black ceiling, and then all the furniture was white. And then I did black and white paintings here on the walls, and every single object in the room was black or white. What was his, his reaction? His reaction was, oh, but it's very stylish. It looks a bit out of place in rural Oxfordshire. 
Did you find it hard to find your own voice to become more fresh? Because obviously your work is unique and personal coming from this background. Um, yes, in many ways, yes, absolutely. And I mean, I made it a bit harder on myself in a way in that, you know, when my papa died, which is 21 years ago now, um, he left me his design rights. And so I've been you know, doing collections of David Hicks by Ashley Hicks. And he had a very distinctive design style, very graphic, very bold, very simple. Draw Benchy Treat, founder of Studio Draw and a designer of an international acclaim, has just published his first monograph, Draw Dreams, Design Without Boundaries. It celebrates his innovation, imagination, and passion for ideas and dreams. Draw, I'm so happy having you here. Thank you for How having me. How are you? Great. You know, something that I really loved about your book is the um, wealth of disciplines that you practice across. You design a vase for Rosenthal, you design chairs for Capellini, luggage for Toomey. What is the role of the designer today? I think in general we are investigating constantly what life is and what's the well-being of people and the surrounding. I think for me um, the role of the designer slightly changed in recent years as we also need to pay a lot of attention to the environment and how we are integrating within the environment, how do we respect the environment, how do we make sure that what we do have the right consequences. I think first and foremost designers are visionaries and they are looking towards the future to give answers. You, you are a graduate from the Academy of Design Eindhoven which has emerged as this institution that trains its students to create conceptual design. Mm -hmm. How is your practice reflecting today the years you spent at Eindhoven? Yeah. I think it's a super interesting question because for me I always say that um, what I learned in Eindhoven is to discover myself, is to really understand what I care about and how to work with different people to practice what I believe in. Um, I think that the idea of this school, which is, you might say, the opposite of being a specialist in a very particular design discipline, is actually learning how to work with specialists and how to co-collaborate um, with different specialists. For me, Eindhoven has been an incredible time because it opens up all the senses. In this fast-paced world, how can one remain fresh? Hmm. So, it depends. For me, it always starts from within. I think that um, understanding your values, understanding your ethics, understanding what matters to you is always the starting point. Uh, if you start to feel like I'm just doing it to please somebody else or I'm just adhering to a brief that I'm not 100% in it, for me it never works. And, and then it helps you to remain pure, genuine? Absolutely. It helps you remain and, pure. And it, it, and it really shows, I mean, in your products. Um, I want to ask you about Richard Baxminster Fuller. He was an American innovator, he was a futurist, he was an architect, and I think he was your hero. Hmm. It, it, was he? Yes, in many ways, absolutely. He died in 1983. What would you ask him if you had a chance to meet him today? He's been an incredible comprehensivist, an incredible innovator. Uh, and I know that he failed many, many, many times in the attempt to bring his vision to reality. Um, what I would love for, to ask him is to protect me. <laughs> the 
The recent news that the two auction brands, Rega of New Jersey and Wright of Chicago, have merged has captured the attention of the industry. Two forces in the world of collectible design and other categories, the two started working together in the summer, and I invited the three leaders behind this merge to speak about how is it going to affect the market. Richard, you are now the CEO. I am. And two presidents, Suzanne and David. Suzanne, how do you envision this merge as um, elevating your capabilities of things you've done before? Well, if you mean personally within the business, um, what's interesting for me is the fact that having a larger staff and a larger pool of people who really know what they're doing uh, is elevating everyone's game. Are you years. talking about experts? I'm talking about experts, I'm talking about a website, uh, folks to ask questions about possible property coming in, who to sell to, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Richard, what really attracted you to get into this merger? So, you know, the, the, the merger came about when David, David first called me, and it was not something that was on my radar screen. Um, but as we started to explore the idea, it immediately started to make sense to me. Um, getting to know David and Suzanne was a turning point. Um, you know, we've been friendly competitors for two decades. How friendly? Not that friendly because we <laughs> compete, but we no, but we were very respectful. So we honestly did not have a personal relationship. We maybe saw each we other a handful of times. Didn't know each yeah. other, and and you know, we 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 both did business the same way, so we never had any conflict. But understanding once once we started actually sitting down that we liked each other, that we could work together, and understanding that our skills and talents complemented each other. You know, one thing these guys are great at is going out, talking to people, doing the road show, going around the country. They have a really big network. You know, I'm really like, you know, think about the marketing and think about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm much more of a private person. Suddenly having a bigger team meant that we could actually do things in a better way. David, what about collectors? How can they be served better? Having access to more information, having a larger team to do the research and, and to, to pull that together so we have a better sense of what we're selling. It's changed our game in, in unforeseen ways and for the better, and that's one of them, is I think the sales are gonna be more interesting. And, and, and you plan such a sale soon, right? Uh, a curated sale uh, together. Uh, the first change was, let's do a Masterworks of American Craft sale First one's going to be in November. And physically, where the pieces are going to be? They will be in Lambertville. Oh, everything. So, yes. So, I mean, David's location and Suzanne's location on the East Coast is better than Chicago. Um, the Chicago team will produce the catalog. It'll be our first co-branded auction. And I think it'll be sort of the right flavor with, with, with a lot of the material that uh, Rego's famous for handling. The two of you have been uh, largely visible on the Antiques Roadshow in PBS for how long? 24 years. 24 years. We're in the relationship business. We're not in the design business, and Roadshow has been a way for us to develop relationships with people, but when you're there and you're at the bar having a martini or going out to dinner or playing poker or something, you become friendly with people who that, that's where the source of material has come from. Wow, Richard, this is amazing, like source. See, I'm in the design business. He's in the, he's in the relationship <laughs> business. This is why it's a good, <laughs> good combo. I think you got to be that point there. Yeah, poker, poker, wine, and food business, and you worry about the, the auctions. <laughs> Richard, is there a way that you can leverage on that merger in terms of excellence and connoisseurship? Sure, I think the larger team is a big part of that. Um, you know, I think that that does less volume. So we're, we've, been, we've had the luxury to work in a more careful way. And I think as we merge, we can also start to bring some of our culture to some of the volume that they do, have the bigger team, and hopefully be able to raise the bar. David does a fantastic job with ceramics, and it's a big field, everything from arts and crafts through, you know, through contemporary ceramics. I think that there's, I think there's a lot more that could be done to build the ceramics market. Mm -hmm. Um, Suzanne is, leads really the, the industry leading sales of contemporary glass. She's going to start curating sections within the right auction. David, how many years have you been in this business? I started in 72. 
40? I was, I was, I was seven three, I was years. Three, I was three years old. Uh, yeah, it's been 47, my 48th year. And so you have witnessed how this, this industry has changed. How do you envision this merge as representing what is happening right now in the market? The biggest change I've seen in the business in the last half century is that it's gotten professional. I mean, back in the day, I mean, you go to the flea market and you're in your truck and you'd get there at dawn and buy a few things and then sell it and go home. It was not a particularly professional business, especially for the young people getting into it. It was re really rock and roll. We knew that merging would write, would, would up our game because we saw the quality of catalogs they were producing. Frankly, I got tired of competing with them. It's way too much work. <laughs> we're gonna have fun now. I will say, it, it's yeah. very clear that there's a wave of aggregation that's starting to happen within the auction industry. Um, uh, it's the natural force of digitization. And I think for strong independent auction houses to survive, uh, you know, coming together to kind of build on the best of what we both do is the path forward. So that's part of the backdrop to what's driving the merger. Italian architect Osvaldo Borsani was among the leading forces in bringing Italian design into the world stage. From the 30s until his death in 1985, Borsani devoted his career to designing furniture. His career is typically divided into two chapters. In the first, he created furniture in the artisanal tradition, and in the second, which started in 1953, he moved to industrial production when founding Techno. A new exhibition at the Nicholas Kilner Gallery highlights the first phase in Borsani's career. Nick, hi. Hi, Daniela. Thank Always you so great having you. Osvaldo Borsani was a great success as a designer during his lifetime, yet his achievements were largely overlooked by those writing design history. It's, it's absolutely true to say. He, um, Osvaldo's contribution to the history of 20th century Italian design is vast. So many of the history books have yet to be written about many of the great figures of Italian 20th century design and Borsani has been one of those figures until very recently where he's begun to receive much more attention. Techno was such a vast success, it still exists today, um, that when people think looking back about his career, that's what they remember. They remember him for those great designs like the P40, one of which you'll find in MoMA's collection. It, it, but it eclipses what happened before. What happened before, to my mind, is of vast historical significance, and that is really the focus of the exhibition. Osvaldo Borsani forged really interesting relationships with artists, such as Lucio Fontana, but other artists as well. Yeah, he, he worked with Roberto Creeper, with Arnaldo and Gio Pomodoro, Eligi Sasu. Uh, but the, the relationship with Fontana was really the most important, and they were very close personal friends. And talking about Fontana, there is the very gorgeous fireplace in Borsani's house, which is located outside of Milan. And that house, you've been to this house. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, um, the, one of the fascinating things about um, the, the history of Borsani um, is the fact that the family have maintained control of the house and the archive throughout this time, which is very rare for, for, for any similar company in Italy. So that means the house is incredibly well preserved and the archive is incredibly well preserved, which to a collector or a dealer or historian is a, is a rare and, and wonderful thing. So the Borsani archive is located right there by the villa and the villa itself has just been open to the public. Nick, what can we expect to see in your new exhibition? Well, it, uh, the show will include elements from uh, the very beginnings of Osvaldo's um, career. So the very early collaborations with his father um, to his earliest designs. Um, but the focus will be on the designs he was making in collaboration with the great artists of the period, very specifically with Fontana. So there'll be a number of collaborative pieces by Borsani and Fontana. I learned about Borsani from you because you, for years, we've known each other for a long time, and for years you've been teaching me about Borsani, and I fell in love with his work. He, he's, he, he's a magnificent designer. And, and specifically with the early phase of his work. Mm -hmm.
Italian architect Achille Salvani devotes 33% of his practice to design furniture, lightings and objects. He utilizes those pieces in his interiors, but also presents them at Maison Girard. His trademark is lending preserved crafts practiced by handful artisans around Rome in creating cutting-edge design. His new book, Achille Salvani, comes to capture the last five years of his practice. Hi Achille, thanks for coming from Rome. Great pleasure. How are you? Fine, thanks. You know, your pieces demonstrate that it is possible to merge modernist aesthetic sensibility with richness of materials that were not necessarily a part of the modernist canon, but ultimately your pieces are very Italian. What does it mean to you, being Italian? Being Italian means uh, having uh, a great heritage to take care of. And being from Rome is even, is even worse, because the heritage is even bigger. You live in Rome? I do live in Rome. Did you grow up in Rome? I did grow oh, up wow. in Rome. Oh wow, you are a true Roman man. Yeah, so it's quite hard to get rid of it. The production of limited edition has become the code in the collectible design world. You can see it in all of the galleries that uh, deal with uh, contemporary design. But to you, production in limited edition has a special meaning. How, how does it come to affect the way you think about your design? It has a special meaning, you're right, because I consider the limited edition a way to set the bar higher and to make my professional challenge always active. I wouldn't like to get stuck to a certain style or to a certain trophy result that would occur over and over in the same way. So the industrial design uh, is, is, is a way to define a successful example of design and to spread out in hundreds, thousands, millions of pieces. The limited edition one is more concentrated in a very short, uh, uh, limited uh, portion that makes you move immediately from one area to another. You know, I asked Pilar Valadis, who is the author of this beautiful book, um, I asked her, how do you distinguish Achille in the fabric of contemporary design today and she said that you have a very special keen interest in history and so when did this start? Probably started from my name since I was a kid all the people who met me and asked me what's your name and I replied Achille every time was who know you know who was Achille from the history so it, it's something that bombarded my youth uh, and probably impressed in a very stable way. So then being from Rome doesn't help to escape from history. Do you have a hero in the history of um, Italian design? Uh, well, or of architecture? course, I could, I could never uh, uh, just think about one, but if I had to choose one, I would, I would definitely choose uh, Ponti. And also what I see similar between you and him is being Italian. Thank you. Very strong national identity. So thank you very much. A great pleasure. Thank you, Daniela. And thanks for tuning in. And until next time, remember, feed your taste. This episode was brought to you by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction.